Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Janice Kamina Resnick, and I'm happy to happy to be back from the northern interior of Alaska, where we not only witnessed the amazing aurora borealis, the northern lights, but also experienced for the first and hopefully the last time in my life, minus 20 degree temperatures. Uh, I welcome you today on behalf of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Zev Yaroslavsky, and myself. I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to today's program, including welcoming today's guest, Jonathan Greenblatt. We appreciate you appearing again on America at a Crossroads, and especially now during these very challenging times, we'll be looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome and thank you as well to our illustrious moderator, Larry Mantle. Uh, as our audience is aware, this week we have two programs. Aside from tonight's program, this Sunday at 1 p.m., it's an odd time because of the time change between here and Israel and the former prime minister's schedule. We welcome the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert. It is not often, if ever, that we get an hour's audience with the Israeli prime minister, uh, so with even a past one. So we, uh, we hope you'll make every effort to join us for his perspectives on what is transpiring politically within Israel, as well as his perspectives on, sorry about that, on the Gaza war. Uh, next Wednesday on March 27th at 5 p.m., we will mark the fourth anniversary and the 200th program of America at a Crossroads. We welcome Jennifer Rubin of the Washington Post. Jennifer was our very first America at a Crossroads guest, and she has joined us each year on our program's anniversary for a program entitled America then, now, and where are we headed? Our moderator will be Warren Olney. For the next couple of weeks, we have two programs each week. It's just the way schedules of the speakers we wanted worked out. So be sure to look at which day of the week we have the programs. Always on Wednesday, but sometimes additionals are either on Monday, Thursday, or Sunday. This week, Jews celebrate the holiday of Purim, which is one of the most festive Jewish holidays where kids dress up in costumes and attend carnivals and fun events. But underneath the fun, there is, of course, a number of very serious topics which underlie the holiday topics like genocide, anti-Semitism, war, corruption, and authoritarianism. The story is told in the book of Esther, Megillat Esther. In short, the holiday commemor commemorates the miracle in which Jews were saved at a at the time of the Persian Empire. An edict had been issued to kill all of Persia's Jews, but through the bravery and courage of Esther and her uncle Mordechai, both Jews, the king rescinded his order and the Jewish people are redeemed in the end. Scholars have long pondered why the name of God is not invoked anywhere in the book of Esther. In fact, this is the only book of the Bible which does not have God's name in it. Of course, this mysterious om omission spawned a great deal of rabbinic debate in short, the analysis which most resonates with me is that fatalism or the notion that God determines the course of history is implicitly rejected. Rather, redemption requires the activism and the courage of human beings. Whether we are talking about combating anti-Semitism, racism, or authoritarianism, it is the courage and activism of human beings which makes the difference. We know that our America at a Crossroads audience is replete with activists who are willing to fight for what we believe is fair, just and right. So go to those carnivals and eat those hamantashen, the three cornered cookies, and sound those noisemakers to drown out the sounds of evil. And most importantly, maintain your activist energy, which is what made the difference during the Persian Empire and indeed still makes the difference in today's times, be it in elections or in other of life's battles. Now, please welcome one of our most popular and skilled moderators, Larry Mantle. Larry has the longest running talk show in Southern California called Air Talk with Larry Mantle, which airs daily and has since, get this, April 1st, 1985, a long time ago. Uh, uh, it's on NPR's member station, LAist, formerly KPCC. He is a fixture in Southern California life and is also a real mensch. So now I hand this program over to Larry Mantle. Larry? Thank you, Janice, Zev, and Mel. We appreciate it so much. It's such a pleasure to be back again for another important America at a Crossroads. And I'm not surprised that there are two programs a week, given all that's going on in the world these days. That makes a lot of sense and so much important material to cover and so many important guests to hear from. And as Janice was just saying, I'll actually be back Sunday afternoon with that interview of the former Prime Minister of Israel. So we look forward to seeing you again then. 
Jonathan Greenblatt has been the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League for nearly a decade. During his tenure, he's restarted the ADL Center on Extremism, which monitors and analyzes extremists and hate groups. And he's launched the annual Never Is Now gathering focused on anti-Semitism and hate. He's founded a number of other initiatives aimed at countering anti-Semitism during his years of heading ADL. Prior to joining ADL, Jonathan served in the Obama administration. Earlier, he co-founded Ethos Brands, which launched the popular Ethos Bottled Water. Jonathan, welcome to America at a Crossroads. You're muted there. What an honor to be on today with you, Larry. I will just say right off the bat, like the sound of your voice has filled my car and my home for many, many years. Uh, and so it's just with great gratitude uh, I'm on today. And I would just be remiss if I didn't, number one, thank Janice and Mel and Zev and all the folks who put together Jews United for Democracy and Justice. I've been a fan of the webcast since they started during COVID. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I'm here today, you know, with an open mind and, and, and excited to talk to all of you, but with a bit of a heavy heart. Because, of course, my friend, former ADL Regional Director David Lair of blessed memory passed last October. Um, you know, my wife worked in that office in the Los Angeles, when she when we lived in Los Angeles, David was a friend for decades. He was at our wedding. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, again, all of us continue to, to cherish his memory and do this work in many ways to honor him and his legacy. Well, Jonathan, you won't be surprised that Janice, Mel and Zeb and I talk so often about David and his legacy and his place not just in Southern California, but of course internationally as these programs have, have grown and, and, and taken off. So let's start. Uh, since Hamas's vicious December 7th attack, the world has changed. Months later, the IDF's bombardment of Gaza has killed thousands and brought tremendous suffering. Israel says Hamas holds 130 hostages, including the bodies of at least 33. Critics of Israel have ranged from questioning its military strategy to holding Israel responsible for the Hamas attack or arguing that Israel doesn't have a right to exist as a protected Jewish nation. What is the ADL's view of what's acceptable criticism, what's unfair, and what's flat out anti-Semitic? So it's a great question, Larry, and it's a good way to start the conversation tonight. Um, what I'd love to do as I answer it is even pull back the lens a bit more and just think about, as you said at the top, I've been in this job for almost a decade, which still seems hard to believe. Uh, sometimes it feels more like 10 minutes rather than 10 years. And yet we're living in very unusual times. So over the last decade, we've watched anti-Semitic incidents skyrocket almost 300 some odd percent before October 7th before 10-7. 2022 was the worst year in terms of tracking incidents that we've ever seen at ADL since we started doing this work, you know, more than four decades ago. And by the way, in 2022, when Israel had a coalition government, Jews and Muslims working together in leadership, left and right working together to lead the country, a pluralistic, heterodox kind of leadership anti-Semitism in this country flared in ways we've just never seen. So the numbers have been going like this. And then after 10-7, things have surged. It's been a tsunami of hate. And we can get into those numbers if you like. But I just want to start by laying out, so we all remember that while this war is happening in Gaza, things here in the U.S. and around the world, affecting Jewish communities in Europe and the Middle East and Latin America and here, are more unstable than we've seen in memory, literally in memory. Now, with that being said, um, the situation in Gaza, the situation in the kind of Middle East is fraught right now. I will be frank, what happened on 10 and I think it affected not just the 1,200 people of blessed memory who were murdered, or the thousands of people who were wounded or lost loved ones, I think the whole Jewish community worldwide was affected by this. Everyone knows someone. I have friends who were killed. I know people who we lost that day. We have family in Israel who were directly affected by this. So this is a kind of trauma 
which should be unusual, but it is actually fairly usual for the Jewish people. Like we've seen slaughter, we've seen persecution, we've seen pogroms. Now, the difference, of course, versus other points in history, Larry, is that today in the state of Israel, the Jews can respond. We're no longer victims. And so I appreciate the fact that the Jewish people are still recovering from this horrible, unprecedented, horrendous crime. Now, that being said, despite those barbaric atrocities, my heart still breaks for every innocent Palestinian who is killed in Gaza. And if you see those pictures and your heart doesn't break, Larry, maybe you don't have a heart. I mean, I don't know how you can see children trapped under rubble or families who've lost members and not, you know, cry for them. We all should, because the Torah teaches, the Talmud actually teaches us, that saving a life is saving the world entire, and taking a life is destroying an entire world. So worlds have been lost in Gaza. Now, whether or not I believe the numbers, 30,000 people killed, I don't believe that number. I don't believe that number because, number one, Hamas fighters don't wear uniforms. They dress like everybody else, and we know they've embedded their military capability inside schools and mosques and hospitals, deep under the ground. So it's hard to discern which lives are innocents or, or which lives are terrorists. But again, John, yeah. every life lost is a crime. But just let me just... Yeah, yeah, because we're just so tight of- on time. And I do want to get to the issue of of what's what's fair criticism, what's unfair, yeah. and what's flat out anti-Semitic so when it comes to criticism of Israel. Well, I certainly think there, you know, um, Natan Sharansky, the noted prisoner of conscience from the former Soviet Union, he laid out a way to think about anti-Semitism relating to Israel, as he called it the 3D test, three Ds, Larry. He said, when you demonize, when you delegitimize, or you hold the country to double standards. So number one, criticism of Israel that demonizes the Jewish state in ways that are never applied to say Russia as they slaughter Ukrainians that are never applied to China in how it you know imprisons and persecutes Uyghur Muslims that are never applied to the Burmese junta that has hunted down and slaughtered Rohingya Muslims when you demonize Jews and you accuse them of being Nazis and you make wild cast wild dispersions on them that is a sign that something is different than just criticizing a country's policies. When you delegitimize, Larry, the existence of the state, and there's a whole kind of BDS industrial complex that exerts a lot of energy not to change policy, Larry, not to work toward a two-state solution, but to undermine the very legal basis or moral premise of the Jewish state. Delegitimizing a country that is facing war, that to me is excessive and different than what other countries face. And finally, Larry, double standards. When you hold Israel to double standards that are not applied to any other country on earth. So what's anti-Semitic? Is it anti-Semitic to say you're angry about the war? No. Is it anti-Semitic to say you want to cease fire now? No. Is it anti-Semitic to say that Israelis are Nazis? Yes. Especially when you don't use that point of comparison for anyone else. Let, let me ask you about the delegitimize, because as you know, there are American Jews who um are are proud to be Jewish, but don't believe that there should be even a two-state solution. There are those who believe it should be one state, one person, one vote, and that Jews and Muslims should live side by side in the totality of what's Israel and Gaza and the West Bank, and, and, and that there shouldn't be a protected Jewish-controlled state. Now, is that anti-Semitic for those American Jews that believe that, they who believe that the time of Israel, that there is not the need to have that protected state in. I mean, look, I actually think what happened on 10-7 makes the case for Zionism more so than anything I could say. There are groups in the Middle East like Hamas that are committed to murdering Jews, that are committed not to a two-state solution, not to a peaceful resolution, not to Palestinian sovereignty, But, I mean, you can read the charter, don't take my word for it, to killing Jews wherever they can find them, behind every rock and tree. So, Larry, when you have genocidal terror groups 
that literally want to kill the Jews, or if you look at Lebanon or Syria or other countries in the region, like, like on Israel's perimeter, look at how religious minorities are treated in Israel. Like the Jewish people have learned for 2,000 years that living as a minority, after they were cast out of their homeland, has not ended well for the Jews anywhere, other than maybe America, Canada, Australia, all the other countries, things have gone south. And so to answer your question, Larry, I think if you look at Jewish history or you look at the recent last 10 years in the region, you can see that religious minorities uh, and different ethnic groups don't fare well. So, but, but you're making a logical and historical argument that yes. the overwhelming majority, I think, of American Jews agree with, and and most non-Jews in this country, I think, agree with that idea. But but it's a logical, it's a historical argument, and for people who disagree with that, say, no, I don't see it that way. I think oh, Jews I would see. be perfectly. Is that and if I mean, you no. may think that they're delusional, but is that anti-Semitic that they hold that view? Well, I think it is, and so the short answer is, if you believe, so let's actually draw a distinction here between people who think, well, I'm not sure I agree with ethno-nationalism, and I think it's an ethno-nationalist state. Well, do you have a problem with Pakistan? No, of course not. Why would I? Why do you hold Israel to a different standard? You can engage in anti-Semitism, Larry, that is unintentional or, or inadvertent but still put you in the same place. When you advocate for discrimination against Jews, that you don't, that you treat them, you would treat them differently than other people's Larry. You might, look, there can be Jewish people who engage in casual anti-Semitism, even if they don't intend it, even if they don't mean it. So let me also, let me, let me make a historical comparison here. There were probably black people in the 1950s or 60s that said, you know what? We don't need the Civil Rights Act. You know what? I'm not sure about that thing, the Voting Rights Act idea that they have. You know what? Our schools are just fine. This whole Brown v. Board of Education thing. They might not have intended to be racist, but propounding a system that institutionally discriminates against Black people, even if you're Black, that can be a kind of racism. And so for Jewish people, even if they don't mean it, they say, why do we need a Jewish state? We don't need that. We'll be just fine in a secular one state. Yeah, sure, Muslims might have the majority, but won't that just be fine? They might not realize they're playing into a discriminatory policy against Jewish people. I, and I understand what you're saying, but I think in the Voting Rights Act, using that example, so there are people who would argue that, well, those who are against uh, lessening uh, the restrictions under the Voting Rights Act for what states can do, that, you know, that's fine. That's that's a difference of opinion. They're not inherently racist. And others would say, no, that's racist. That's really about perpetrating exclusion for African-Americans being able to participate in democracy. Is, is that not an acceptable debate to have whether it is racist or not? Of course, you can have these debates. But let's be clear about one thing. The issues that Israel is facing are not theoretical. They are literally existential. Let's be clear. The Houthis in Yemen are trying to send, would like to send hypersonic missiles to Tel Aviv. Okay, so for them, this isn't a theoretical or abstract conversation. This is very real. Iranian proxies around the region are bent on trying to destroy the Jewish state. So the one thing I would say, like we can argue whether Candace Owens or Clarence Thomas, maybe not by intent, but by dint of the outcomes that their ideas or their policies would incur, result in a can, could result in a in a perpetuation of anti-black racism. Okay, but for but Jews, that, these issues are not like wow. I wonder what that's like. It's like very real, Larry. People who want to and are trying to kill us because of our identity. Let, let me move on to another question. Several months ago, you praised Elon Musk's announcement that X, formerly Twitter, would ban the term decolonization and the slogan from the river to the sea, ban it is anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, you've had criticism of that approach from some yeah. even close to the ADL. Why do you consider those terms to be anti-Semitic and, and worthy of a social media ban? So let's talk about that and then let's come back to Elon Musk because I think I got a lot of criticism about my take on Elon Musk, and I'd love to talk about that. So starting with the terms, look, those terms, like, for example, from the river to the sea, from the river to the sea is not some, you know, cute phrase that the kids at 
on the Harvard Yard dreamt up a couple months ago. Literally, again, it comes from the Hamas Charter. It's about cleansing the region of Jews from the river to the sea. Palestine shall be free from the river to the sea is, again, like credit the guys from credit Hamas for their poetic license and their ability to rhyme effectively. That's where this comes from. It didn't just pop into the heads of co-eds at Berkeley. So that's germane because understanding its history, we've watched it be normalized in the last six months, um, you know, around the post 10-7 conflict. And by the way, they didn't start chanting that, Larry, when Israel went into, when the IDF went into Gaza. They started chanting and all the stuff exploded on campuses, Larry, and in, in the public discourse on 10-7, okay? So we should talk about that in a, in a follow-up question. 10-7 is when this stuff exploded. But so why did I have that reaction? Because we see the call from the river to the sea as a call to genocide. And I must tell you, I will talk to anybody. I try to live by a dictum of not cancel culture, but counsel culture. Meaning when someone makes a mistake, I don't push them away. I try to pull them in. I don't eject them from the public conversation. I want to embrace them and help them to get it right. That's our discipline at ADL. Okay. Now that's material here because the people saying from the river to the sea are calling for, to are literally dehumanizing Jews and calling for violence against all Israeli Jews. And if my only line that I draw, Larry, is if you dehumanize people, I won't humanize you. And so if you said uh, eliminate all the, the trans people, I would have a problem with that. And if you said kill all the Palestinians, I would have a problem with that. And if you said from the river to the sea, meaning cleanse all the Jews, I have a problem with that too. For those who see Israel as a colonizer, and this is common rhetoric, this is, it's, and it's part of a larger framework that doesn't just affect Israel, but is part of the whole anti-colonialization um, uh, rhetoric that we hear, particularly from uh, the far left. So um, Israel is not alone in this, but if people hold that view, should they not be able to express it again, even if you think they're grossly misguided and don't understand their history, they should, should they be barred from saying that? Absolutely should be able to express it. Absolutely. If you should be able to say from the river to the sea. But you know what? Twitter can make the decision not on my platform. But so, you applauded the decision. Correct, I that. did. I Correct, I did, because it's an incitement to violence. And because Twitter is a business, Larry, Twitter is not the public square. Twitter is not, you know, you know, is like it's not standing on a corner in Brentwood and saying, this is what I believe. It's a company trying to drive revenue, trying to bring in advertisers, something that Elon Musk hasn't done nearly as well as he would like. Um, and businesses look, by the way, you know who else has the right to decide who they bring to their platform? You, you do at an air talk and you get to decide who you interview and who you don't. And you get to decide, will I bring on, you know, Nick Fuentes to articulate his philosophy? Will no. I bring on the head of the Westboro Baptist Church to explain their theology? And you get to say, no, thank you. Now, you know what? Does that mean the Westboro Baptist Church doesn't have the right to do what they do? Of course they do. But you get to decide who comes on your show. Uh, Twitter was making the very same decision, and I applaud them for that. Let's let's talk about. You said you wanted to talk about Elon Musk in more yeah, detail. So Before, I got so so. Let me just let me preface it enough. so folks are on the same page. So and and you can add to it if I'm not asking what you want to say. But before Elon Musk acquired Twitter, you praised him as an amazing entrepreneur, an extraordinary innovator, the Henry Ford of our time. Since you called on companies to stop advertising on X after yep. Musk endorsed it tweet claiming that Jews promote hatred against whites. He's threatened to sue the ADLO, uh, ADL over the ad withdrawals. So what's your view of Musk and X now? Well, look, so Musk is a, uh, so I've been dealing with him for the last year and a half uh, since before he acquired the company. Number one, he is an extraordinary innovator. If you look at Tesla and SpaceX and you think that he's not, I think maybe you're not paying attention. On the other hand, I absolutely disagree with a number of his personal views, strongly, profoundly, and I have called him out repeatedly. But again, I try to live by a dictum of cancel culture. So that week, when he retweeted out something about the great replacement theory, 
this conspiratorial idea that the Jews are trying to flood America with Muslims or migrants, some revolting racist idea. I criticized him for it. And then two days later, when he talked about River to the Sea, I complimented him for it. I think our job at ADL is to call balls and strikes. Again, not to, excuse, not to excommunicate someone from the public square, but to call it like we see it. And so I absolutely don't agree with him on everything, but when he gets it right, I'm willing to acknowledge that. Um, and so I think Thank in the world we live in today, it's so polarized. So your question was like, well, what do you think of Elon Musk? Good, bad. And we're often, things are reductive. Like, are you on the red team or the blue team? Are you good or bad? And I think sometimes life is more complicated and more nuanced. And that's I mean, what I was, that's what I'm speaking yeah, to. Yeah, and, and we received a number of, of, of questions even before doing this event from people asking about your view of Musk, because for some of the viewers who are watching this, they see Musk as someone who has cozied up to far right wing thinking and individuals, and that he has an incredible megaphone in X, formerly Twitter, to be able to amplify those voices, and that anything that legitimizes him makes it easier for him to do that and for things that he amplifies or accepts on his platform to be legitimized. How do you respond to those who take That's issue correct. with you doing for that reason? Well, look, like it is certainly true, and I criticized him for platforming white nationalists who we said should come off. I criticize him for replatforming President Trump, who we call to be taken off. Like, I think those things that he's done are wrong. So I think we should have the intellectual honesty to acknowledge that you can get it wrong and sometimes you get it right. And complimenting someone or crediting them when they get it right, Larry, doesn't absolve them of all their prior sins. It doesn't somehow, you know, excuse all the previous missteps. So I don't think I've done that. Look, I think there are things... Um, that we all do in life. We sometimes you get it wrong, sometimes you get it right. But it's my job at ADL to fight hate. And I will call people out when they cozy up to white nationalists, as we've done with Musk again and again and again. It's odd, Larry, that the only thing that gets attention is when we do something that goes against the grain. But if you look at the totality of what ADL said about Elon Musk, or what we've said about Twitter and social media, no one would accuse us of giving him a free pass. He certainly doesn't. Federal investigations have been launched targeting several high-profile universities for not adequately protecting their Jewish students and staff. A recent University of Chicago poll found 56% of American Jewish college students uh, felt themselves in danger. And we've had at UC Berkeley, Professor Ron Hasner has been doing his two-week sleep-in to protest how his university has handled it. We've had Dean Erwin Chemerinsky of the UC Berkeley School of Law and talking about uh, his concerns about how administration has handled it at his school, though he doesn't support the lawsuits that have been filed against UC Berkeley. Um, so, you know, where where do you see uh, the climate on America's college campuses going, and is there a corner starting to be turned, or is it is is this still highly problematic? I think it's still highly problematic. I mean, let's acknowledge that the issues on these campuses are not new; they have been complicated for a long time. Let's acknowledge that um, countries or or people have been struggling with these issues of left, right, and the college campuses have always been a place that's ripe with debate. But the data you shared is real. I talk to, I travel the country, I'll be in Winston-Salem tomorrow at Wake Forest, and I go to universities. In the last couple of weeks, I've been to Brown, Vanderbilt, Columbia, a bunch of others, and the issues that these Jewish kids are facing are real. I've heard stories about kids getting spit on walking across the quad. I've heard stories about Jewish kids moving out of their dorms for fear of their physical safety. I've heard stories about Hillel's being vandalized, windows being broken. We know, I, I happen to know the two young women who were assaulted at Cal maybe a month ago when an IDF reservist was invited to speak. I mean, they're family friends. So these issues are close to home. They are real. The only way this changes is if people in positions of authority start exercising a kind of con moral consistency in the way that they apply and enforce the rules. That's what I would hope for at all these institutions. How can you codify this? I mean, walking this line between the respect for free speech, which you're just making the point, you have to have that. That is, that is part of academic and intellectual inquiry. You've got to have that. Um, but students have a right 
to feel that they're not going to be physically assaulted. As Professor Dean Chemerinsky has said, you don't have a right to be protected against language that offends you even very deeply and you feel that dehumanizes you. But you have a right to be protected against threats and against the possibility that you will be physically harmed. So what sorts of, of rules do you think that these universities need to establish and need to enforce to provide that protection but freedom of speech? I'll give you three examples right off the bat. Number one, um, and by the way, all the schools already have codes of conduct. So let's just acknowledge that I think simply enforcing their own rules, Larry, would go a long way. And I will say, to build upon your question, I deeply believe in free speech. And I don't believe, maybe this will make me controversial, in safe spaces. I believe in brave spaces where you have difficult, hard conversations and you talk across difference. But I would do three things that would make these campuses better. Number one, no masked people on campus. If you wear a keffiyeh around your head, like you're posing for an ISIS video, if you intentionally wear sunglasses and a hat and a mask, like you're getting ready to rob a bank, I think you should do that somewhere else. I think university presidents, and we've seen this, the assaults and the vandalism, it's almost always done by people who dress like this. So you know what, that may make sense. Again, if you're an extra on, a, on an ISIS or an a, episode of Homeland, it doesn't make sense in the United States of America. So number one, no masking on campus. Number two, we should have protest zones. It is not okay if you go to a classroom with a bullhorn screaming about the occupation. It is not okay if you march through a student center screaming about this or genocide. You want to protest, you should be able to do that over there. And if I'm a student like I was, and I'm there to take my classes, and I'm a work-study student, I got to, you know, get my hours to pay for school, I should be able to do that without fear of being assaulted or harassed. So I'm all for protests. Just have protest zones where it take place. It shouldn't interfere with my ability as a student to study in the library, to attend a class, to hear a lecture. So, so number one, no masking. Number two, protest zones. And number three, I think we need to have a serious conversation about diversity education on these campuses. Now, there are many people who say we need to end DEI. Look, I don't believe that. Diversity education is critical. We live in the most heterogeneous, the most multicultural society on earth. Learning about our peers, classmates or colleagues makes us better classmates or colleagues, better managers better administrators. So I believe in diversity education, but there is a problem as we've seen at ADL when the notion of diversity, edu diversity, equity, and inclusion, Larry, promotes the exclusion of Jews. We're a very data-driven organization, and we found through our studies that more than 80% of college students who've done DEI programming say there's been no content about anti-Semitism or Jews. Well, that's crazy. And forcing our kids to play in the oppression Olympics where your team oppressed or team oppressor is crazy. So I think we need not to end DEI, but to mend it and to make sure that all people, whatever their faith or ethnicity or level of ability or gender or race, get an opportunity to learn about one another with respect and decency. Well, with and is this, is this an issue with DEI or is this with an issue, a larger issue within academe and, and a fair amount of the American left which reduces conflicts to who has the power and who has financial resources and who doesn't have power and who's lacking financial resources. And then the quick judgment that whoever is, is considered in the lesser position is less powerful is, is by definition the aggrieved person. And the person who is in the position of greater power is the person to be criticized. So I, if is that is that what some would argue is a construct that we often see in academe, which isn't really analyzed any more closely than that, is that more the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very astute kind of diagnosis. I mean, these notions of power and these theories of oppression, again, I understand how they play out on paper, but in the real world, it's just more complicated than that. The idea that, uh, you know, because look, I present as white. And my grandparents were from Europe. That makes sense. 
But to say that I therefore I have all the power is crazy. Or to say that therefore all Jews look like this is wrong. I mean, my wife is Iranian. She's quite darker complected than any of us. She, I mean, you could say many things about it. You wouldn't call her white, but because she's Jewish, she has power. I mean, her family was impoverished in Iran. So like there's a level of sanctimonious here, sanctimonious is here, which is sort of context independent. And I think what we need to do is recognize that all individuals are sui generis. We should be evaluated on our own merits as people. We can understand the broader trends, but this reductive, you know, phenomenon you're talking about is a real problem on parts of the so, left. And Jonathan, I, you know, I back to your three points, the no masking, the protest zones, and and um uh, revamping revamping diversity education. Um, you know, specifically as you you know, and I'm I I'm not a legal scholar at all, but those protest zones have been uh uh, sued against in the past. There have been different court decisions. So there are constitutional issues. I don't know what the law says about masking, but you've given good questions for us to ask Dean Chemerinsky the next yeah. time that we have conversations. Push, push him the next but, time you talk to him. I want you to push him or Janice or Mel or Zeph. You push Dean Chemerinsky. I mean, he's an incredible legal scholar and a great mind. We don't always agree on everything, but you should say to him, hey, is there a constitutional way to protect not just the rights of the people speaking, but the rights of the people listening. I'm a student going to class. It shouldn't be interrupted by some lunatic, you know, again, who looks like he's in a Boko Haram, you know, video. Before we get to viewer questions, I wanted to ask you about the recent Never Is Now dinner. Uh, the ADL honored former Trump administration, senior advisor Jared Kushner, is also the former president's son-in-law. He was praised by the ADL for his work on the Abraham Accords that normalized relations between Israel, UAE, and Bahrain. There was criticism of that agreement from some that it, it didn't include rights of Palestinians. And there's also been abundant criticism of Kushner for supporting his father father-in-law's sure. political career, given Trump's multiple defenses of and meetings with extremists and even Holocaust deniers. We've had a number of viewers who want to know what you were thinking with honoring Jared Kushner. So I'm super happy to talk about it, Larry. So step back. This was an award about the Abraham Accords. And I, I guess there's different opinions about it. There's probably different opinions about, I don't know, the Louisiana Purchase. And there's probably different opinions about like the campaign. There are, I can assure you there are, but yes. Yeah, so like there's different, let's just acknowledge, or the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, there are different opinions about every kind of agreement out there. So this was about Israel normalizing relations with part of the Arab world, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, and it was slated to expand even further to different parts of the Arab world, but the Muslim world too, which would have been amazing. It's still, I think, look at ADL, we believe in a two-state solution. At ADL, we believe that Jews and Palestinians, uh, Israelis and Arabs should be able to live with dignity and equality with one another. That's what we believe. The Abraham Accords were a step in that direction. And what we were trying to do, Larry, was to be bipartisan. We were trying very hard and again, you can disagree with us and you can push back, but we felt like Jared Kushner was someone that we could recognize because A, he has no role in the campaign, B, he said he won't be involved in the new White House, and C, he was the driving force on the Abraham Accords. Now, I have all the scars, Larry. I have all the bruises. I have all the injuries from years of criticizing candidate Trump, president-elect Trump, President Trump. I was probably more out there than any other Jewish communal leader um, it, in terms of the major organizations. Lots of rabbis stood up, like I appreciate Sharon Browse and I appreciate uh, Rick Jacobs and many of my friends who stood up and spoke out. But you know what? I think that uh, we have got to try to be bipartisan. So whereas I criticize his father-in-law intensely and still do, I criticize him this week for his but insane comments about Democrats and Jews. This was trying to be bipartisan finding a way to recognize a prominent Republican on an issue that I thought people on both sides could agree that the but, Abraham Accords were a good thing. But there are many Republicans who are were not so intimately involved with the Trump administration who are very supportive of Israel, very supportive of protections for American Jews. You chose to honor Jared Kushner, who's a particularly polarizing figure. You You're could right, have been bipartisan in other ways. Yeah, look, and we always are, we always try to be. Um, but the truth is, is that this is about the Abraham Accords. I wasn't trying to just find any old Republican. I was trying to find someone who's involved okay. in this 
okay. this thing post 10 7 that was important and let me get back to the nonpartisanship because i understand that that is core that's central to the adl but given what you've said about former president trump and that for lack of a better term you see him as a menace uh, in, in many of the ways in which rhetoric and our whole dialogue has changed since he was elected president. How does the ADL sit this out? How does the ADL treat it as though this is just another election between two different parties? Well, I, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think we can't sit it out. We've got to call balls and strikes. And he's throwing an awful lot of balls way off the plate that we have to call as they are. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that when you accuse, what did he say? That like Jewish people who vote for Democrats hate Israel or like, or that we're the dual loyalty thing, the kind of, you know, excoriating Jews lecturing us, it's wrong. And I will call it out every single time. I don't think I can afford to quote, sit out the election in the interest of being a uh, nonpartisan, but we have to be bipartisan and try to find the good on both sides. But I will while I try to be bipartisan, Larry, it's not about being political, it's about being principled. And so we will not hesitate when hate happens to call out the people responsible for it. And that has meant again and again and again. I mean, look, I called for Trump to, to resign. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, like I, nobody would accuse, I, it's funny, Larry, I've had lots of accusations leveled at me over the years. I, few would say that I'm a Trump apologist, but I understand for a lot of people who are still so concerned Jared, even though he's not involved in this current campaign, was a bridge too far. I get that. And people are entitled to their opinion. Merlin, one of our viewers, said Kushner turned his acceptance speech into a campaign pitch for Trump. He said, I know you couldn't control his speech, but that was very upsetting. Merlin said, I didn't hear the speech. Did you consider it um, beneficial to his father-in-law? I mean, look, uh, two things. So number one, the first 80, 85, 90% of the speech was, I think, everyone agreed with. He spent the last 10%, 50% of the speech talking about his father-in-law, saying he wasn't an anti-Semite, explaining certain things. Look, he's it's the father, it's the grandfather of his children. I guess I understand why he said what he said. I wish he hadn't said it, Larry. But but I, I should make one other point, Larry. You know, Attorney General Merrick Garland also spoke on our stage. And Hillary Clinton also spoke on our stage. And U.S. Ambassador Deborah Lipson also spoke on our stage. Now, Deborah and uh, Merrick Garland are both employed by President Biden, and they both extolled the work of the Biden administration. Was that political? Because Biden's running too. So I, I just think we need to be a yeah. little even-handed about how we see these things. Joel asks, given that the war in Gaza was instigated by an unprovoked Hamas attack on October 7th, how did Hamas manage to seize the global PR advantage? How do Jewish supporters of Israel effectively push back on it? Israel's own communication act effort has been relatively ineffective. That's Joel asking. Yeah, I mean, like I'm not a PR expert, but Joel's not wrong. It's been very, it's been heart-wrenching. Look, I wear this dog tag, you know, to, re to remember the hostages in Gaza, but it's heart-wrenching to me that we don't see more people doing this. And I had a conversation on Capitol Hill last week with a woman who came up to me and said, hey, I'm for a ceasefire. And I said, that's great. Where's your yellow pin to talk about the hostages being freed? She said, what's that? You know, look, I mean, I just think it's heartbreaking that the, look, the, the loss of life in Gaza is horrible. It is tragic. And I understand when people see that and they're gripped. I wish the Israelis could better communicate the narrative of these innocent men and women and boys and girls and elderly people who were seized from their homes, taken, I mean, the, the stories are just so horrifying, Larry. It's heartbreaking. They haven't told their story more effectively. And, and you mentioned earlier, this not from a viewer, but from me, you mentioned earlier about that this condemnation of Israel came the day of the attack by Hamas. It didn't come after Israel's military response. To what do you attribute that? Um, well, it's an interesting question. Uh, look, I think on election day 2016, Larry, to get back to the President Trump issue, white nationalists, when he won, things exploded and we saw hate go crazy. I think people on the extreme right felt like they suddenly had permission to express their latent views about Jews or Blacks or other minorities. 
And October 7th, as it became clear that you know people had been massacred, people here on the far left exploded with joy. We saw like the Black Lives Matter um, Twitter account from Chicago posting images of hang gliders, you know, which was revolting. We saw other people extolling the, the, the courage and the bravery. We saw people in the media. I mean, it was almost like this latent anti-Zionist, anti-Israel sentiment just exploded into the public. But I will also tell you, Larry, that we saw these anti-Zionist, anti-Israel groups release discussion guides and toolkits on October the 8th, claiming there was a genocide happening in Gaza. On October the 8th, claiming that the Zionist entity was responsible for what happened the day before. It was as if it was pre-organized or something. Our analysts found these materials on October the 8th. So whereas I think some of it was spontaneous and an explosion of kind of latent hate, some of it was planned. And I think they were waiting for a moment and then they let loose. Diane asks whether ADL feels police are adequately protecting Jews from aggressive, mostly pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian demonstrations. What, if anything, is ADL doing to ensure that uh, law enforcement protects people under attack, be it on campuses or in communities? Yeah, look, law, law enforcement, I, I, the letter was... Uh, the law enforcement issues are... on. Look, I will say law enforcement is our trusted partner at ADL. I think we have so much respect and appreciation for the work that the police do every day to try to keep all of us safe. They have plenty of problems, but they do so much good work. That being said, look, we've seen a huge spike, like 330% vandalism and harassment and assaults. You know that man was killed, as you likely know. Was it in Simi Valley or Ventura? That man was killed at um, an Israel rally. An elderly person was hit in the head with a megaphone. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, I think police are trying to do their best. But I, I, I'll i be honest, I wish they would do more. I don't think you should ever have a case where, again, people flood an event like happened in Berkeley and break windows and assault students. But by the way, I've got to acknowledge, I mean, we've seen businesses targeted. We've seen, you know, in Chicago, the artist Madis Yahoo, he's a sing Jewish singer. His concert was canceled because the police said they couldn't adequately protect him. Like something is wrong in this country if law enforcement feels like they simply they can't do their jobs. And I think we need stronger enforcement and we need discipline applied to get to create some kind of deterrent. Well, what's often called the heckler's veto, the ability of or or worse than heckler, if we're talking about actual threats of harm to people. Uh, Perry asks, what precipitated the 300% increase in anti-Semitism back in 2022? And what can we do about that, that earlier surge, even pre-October 7th? It's a really good question. So it's been intensifying. Again, it started in 2016. It can, it's continued to go up. It's continued to go up under the in these last few years of the Biden presidency. I think, number one, anti-Semitism has been normalized, Larry. And I think we need our leaders to lead more effectively to call out hate when it happens from either side. I think number two, extremists feel emboldened and these crazy conspiracies blaming the Jews for COVID or A Asian Americans for COVID. This normalization of hate creates bad ramifications for all of us. And I need, we, I think we also, so number one, leaders need to lead and call out hate when it happens irrespective of the politics. Number two, extremists need to be marginalized and pushed back. And we need a bold, more muscular center. And number three, and maybe most importantly, again, we need to find ways to come together. There's too much polarization in this country, Larry. There's too much scapegoating and blame game. We need to find ways to get past that. We have so many strong questions from viewers today. I'm going to try and get to as many as I can. Victor asks, can you compare anti-Semitism today with anti-Semitism in the U.S. in the 1930s? Do we have a, have a Father Coughlin today, for example? Tucker Carlson is the Father Coughlin of this current era. The Father Tucker Carlson is the closest equivalent to someone with a huge megaphone who uses it to go after in a vindictive, slanderous way a group of people. He used a show on Fox, and now he's using it on X or whatever, but I think he's the closest equivalent. But on the other hand, um, look, Jews today are, have succeeded in lots of ways. I mean, we now have had great achievements in politics and business and, and, and arts and 
So I, I do think the Jews have a lot more standing today than we did in America 90 years ago. And we also have the sovereign state of Israel, which we didn't have before. So those things give me hope. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the good guys win, but we got to lean in, Larry. We got to put our shoulder to the wheel. Turns out democracy is not a, it's not a spectator sport. And no one should know that more than the Jewish people. So we got to run for office. We got to vote in the ballot box. We got to get engaged if we want to turn this around. Uh, Myra asks, what does ADL think about um, Majority Leader Schumer's request that Netanyahu resign? You know, I wish Majority Leader Schumer had focused not on regime change in Israel, but regime change in Iran. Because <laughs> I think if that happened, we'd all be better off. Uh, I think Iran is the most malevolent force in the region, not the state of Israel. Look, I know, I know Majority Leader Schumer. I've worked with him for years. I know he loves the Jewish state. I think he said this out of a place of love, but I think at the end of the day, I wish that American politicians wouldn't try to interfere with Israeli politics. And I don't think Israel, if the hostages came home tomorrow, Larry, all this would end. If the Hamas just released the hostages, we'd have a ceasefire. So I wish from Senator Schumer to everyone else would focus on that, because if that would happen, if Hamas would release the hostages none of this would continue. And of course, in his position, some criticized him and said this was inappropriate for him as, as you know, the highest ranking Jewish American to, to make this comment. But others said, well, this is the view of the majority of, of, of Jews in the United States. They they want Netanyahu to go. He's deeply unpopular. And of course, not just in this country, but in Israel, although in Israel, there's support for the way that Israel is, is prosecuting the war, but, but not for him personally. So is is he out of step in making that call, given that he's given voice to probably where the overwhelming majority of the American Jewish community is? So I can't generalize like that because that I don't know. I do think you're not, I think you're right to, to say that President, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Netanyahu is somewhat unpopular, fairly unpopular with a lot of us. But that being said, look, there are different ways to skin a cat, Larry. And I think the majority leader's comments or his message might have been better delivered in private than in public the way that he did. I think we're in a moment now when Jewish people, secular and observant, left and right, red and blue, east and west, need to come together and show unity in the face of the greatest threat that we've faced arguably since 48. So I'd rather see unity in our community. I'd rather get past the polarization. And I think more unity would be better than, than division. But if there's unity around a government that so many Americans think is engaging in policies that are damaging to peace and the potential for a two-state solution, and they feel that Netanyahu's leadership has made that much more difficult, then in, in being unified around Israel's response to this terrible thing that, that happened on, uh, on uh, October 7th, is, is that really in the best interest of Israel writ large? If, if, if you're just saying, well, we're going to be silent about an administration that we think is actually harmful to the country. Well, look, I mean, I think there's lots of criticism of Bibi Netanyahu. There's lots of criticism of the state of Israel. Um, so I, I don't think we suffer from a paucity of people talking about the Jewish state, of arguing about its policies or calling it out. I, I, but on the other hand, what I would say is that, look, they're a democracy, they have an elected government, they have rule of law and a whole process. I think in this moment, what I want is for the hostages to come home. In this moment, I want hate to, to come down here in the United States. In this moment, I ultimately want people, irrespective of how they pray or, or where they're from or who they love, I want them to live with safety and security, whether it's the United States or Israel or anywhere else in the world. Uh, let me share another uh, question from our viewers, uh, and this is from uh, a viewer, who, Eric, who asks, well, do you think Bernie Sanders, who lobbies to cut aid and, and put conditions on the aid to Israel, is he anti-Semitic for holding that position? No. I mean, again, I think you're entitled. I don't agree with Senator Sanders. He's not anti-Semitic. Again, I don't think he's right on Israel or some other policies, but that doesn't mean he hates Jews or discriminates against them. Okay. We we kind of sideswiped this earlier, but we've had people who really want to hear you elaborate on this. Former President Trump's comments that uh, Jews who would vote for Democrats um, hate their religion and I mean, uh, hate Israel. 
your it's, response to that? It's, it's so absurd. It's insulting. Look, first of all, it's patently false. Second of all, it's prejudice, right? I don't need Donald Trump lecturing me about my Judaism or how other Jews, just because the way he doesn't like the way that they vote. Um, I, I hate to even give this, this absurd statement any oxygen because I think it's beneath me and beneath all of us, but it's frightening when when the when the uh, nominee for one of the major parties would say such a horrendous, obviously um, insulting thing. But so look, it's I, I think holding out Jews for discrimination or different treatment just because of our identities, our faith, our ethnicity, that's the pat, that's the definition of anti-Semitism. And it's wrong whomever it comes from. Jonathan asks, why isn't ADL and other Jewish organizations uh, having counter demonstrations against anti-Israel pro-Palestinian demonstrations? Look, at ADL, our focus is on fighting anti-Semitism in all forms of hate. Like literally, we're focused on responding to hate crimes and dealing with the victims. Last year, Larry, we had over 30,000 hate crimes and bias incidents called into ADL. We're focused on monitoring extremists and helping law enforcement put them away so we can neutralize threats. Last year, we educated over four and a half million kids in classrooms all over America. You know, last year, we litigated cases in the courts and we lobbied Congress. We don't do the assembling people for demonstrations. It's just not our thing. There are other groups like okay. IAC does some of this and others. I, I salute them. It's just not what we do. So uh, because uh, this program is based in Southern California, but viewed all over the world, I do want to ask you about this. We're very tight on time, and I want you to have some time I'll try to be tight. quick close. But the writer-director of the Zone of Interest criticized Israel in his recent Oscar acceptance speech. Jonathan Glazer said he refuted his Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. He was roundly applauded in the Dolby Theater. Since hundreds of Jewish figures in Hollywood have signed an open letter denouncing the remarks, the ADL quickly condemned Jonathan Glazer's speech. Quick comment on on what? Like, he look, said. instrumentalizing instrumentalizing the Holocaust for your own political agenda is wrong, no matter who does it. Just because he directed a movie about the Shoah doesn't give him the right to abuse the memory of those who died in the Shoah for his own political purposes. So I thought it was inappropriate and wrong. All right, a chance for you, and in the spirit of David Lehrer who always wanted us to end on, on a note that gives us some hope, a feeling that things might well get better, provided it's a realistic look into the future. So Jonathan, if you would close just what hope, if any, you see for countering anti-Semitism. Look, last last uh, two weeks ago, we had our big conference, Never Is Now, Larry, and over 4,000 people came together. 4,000 people from all over the country, of all political persuasions, from all walks of life, of all ages, they showed up to be together. And while I am concerned, I'm concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism, I'm concerned about the growth of hate, I am long on America. Because there's never been a country, again, more pluralistic, there's never been a country more resilient, and there's never been a place that's been better for the Jewish people. So I believe if we, if we dig deep, Larry, if, if we find our strength, and if we evoke the spirit of someone like David Lehrer, who spent his life bringing people together, I know we can get past this and have a better tomorrow. Well, no question about that. Uh, David Lehrer was such a positive influence on so many of our lives. Jonathan, thank you very much for being with us this evening. We appreciate it so much. And we'll look forward to talking with you again, hopefully soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Larry, Janice, Zev, and Mel. I appreciate all of you so much. And I just want to say to our viewers, this is so uh, such a great example of, of the kinds of conversations that we have here about these issues that are vitally important. And we ask for your financial support for this nonprofit series that's provided, of course, free of charge, but requires donations to keep the series operating. So please, you can go to the website of Jews United for Democracy and Justice, uh, known by the acronym JUDGE. You'll find their website easily through search, and please consider making a tax-deductible contribution. I just want to remind you that I'll be back with you Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Pacific time, an unusual time, but that because of the uh, differences we heard earlier from Janice with the time zone difference with Israel. And I'll be joined by the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Omert. Uh, we uh, look forward to that conversation, 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern time, right here at America. 
at Crossroads. From all of us, have a very good evening.